This episode of Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inside the Breakthrough, surprising stories from the history of science. This new podcast connects old stories to what modern day medical researchers are facing. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Hello and welcome to one of our classic episodes. I am so glad to have you here. I am your host, Stacey Sims. And as always, we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I want to talk to you about Sphere a Rose. And if you think you know what that is all about, stay tuned anyway, because I guarantee nobody else has done a podcast like this on this issue all about Sphere a Rose. So what is it? Well, each February since 2013, the diabetes online community all over the world has supported the charity Life for a Child through the Spare a Rose, Save a Child campaign. It is a very simple idea. Valentine's Day is coming up and the campaign goes all throughout February. But the thinking is that you should send 11 rather than 12 roses to the person that you love on Valentine's Day. And then the money that you saved from that one rose goes to Spare a Rose. And that one rose will provide a child with diabetes in an under-resourced country enough insulin for one month. The math here is pretty simple. One rose equals one month. There are links in the show notes and on the homepage. I'll put them out on social as well with more information and easy ways to donate. I set mine up every year to just kind of keep going every month. It's very simple. And I was really excited way back when for my first Spare a Rose episode on this podcast because I got to talk to three terrific advocates who helped create and nurture the program and continue to do so today. So I'm really excited to bring you this classic episode from 2016, which also features my very first game show on this podcast. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, this episode of Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inside the Breakthrough, a new history of science podcast full of did you know stuff. The most recent episode is all about the electric car. I got a sneak peek, a sneak listen. I love this show. It is all about how bad timing killed the electric car, but it's also uh, explaining rural versus urban and women entering the workforce. And there's so much going on in the background of the story. Inside the Breakthrough was created by Symar. Symar is a group of Canadian researchers dedicated to changing the way we detect, treat, and even reverse type 2 diabetes. You can find Inside the Breakthrough and this latest episode at diabetes-connections.com or just search for it anywhere you listen to podcasts. My guests this week are three people familiar to many of you. They always step up when they're needed, and I'm lucky to call them my friends now. Scott Johnson works at My Sugar. He was there back when we spoke for this interview, but I knew him best at the time from his blog, Scott's Diabetes. Bennett Dunlap has two children with type 1. They're adults now. And since we first spoke, he has been diagnosed with type 2. He's been very open about that. He's been writing about that. And uh, we last spoke when uh, we were on a panel in, gosh, in November or December just of last year, and he was continuing to share his story. Carrie Sparling was writing Six Until Me every weekday at the time of this interview. She did close the book on that blog not too long ago. She has just published a book of poetry. It's called Rage Bolus. And I will have a link in the show notes. I just found out about that. I haven't had a chance to order my copy myself, but I will. Very excited for Carrie on that. And another note, Spare a Rose itself has changed a little bit since this interview. You'll hear us talk about Johnson & Johnson's involvement, a few other points that may have changed, but the mission and the need have not changed. So if you can help, please do so. And remember, this podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Bennett, Carrie, and Scott, welcome to Diabetes Connections. Oh, thank you, Stacey. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a thrill. Thanks. Carrie, let's start with you. Tell me a little bit about how Spiro Rose came about. I'm sure, and I'll probably screw it up just a little tiny bit. So guys, feel free to jump in and correct <laughs> me at any point. But um, Spare Rose was born out of, as you had mentioned, the Partnering for Diabetes Change uh, group kind of got together and tried to come up with an idea. And it's not exactly, it's actually not at all sponsored by the IDF. But their charity, Life for a Child, benefits from this program. So what it is, like you said, you know, instead of buying the roses, you you uh, really what it actually is. Let me just back up a little bit. Is it's a way for those of us who have access to a lot to acknowledge that privilege and to kind of pop that bubble of privilege and help touch the lives of people outside of that access point and you know give a little of what we have to other people living with diabetes. We know what it's like 
to miss an insulin injection or undercalculate an insulin dose. We know what high blood sugars feel like. The idea of having a child suffer from that and potentially die from that is, is too heartbreaking to even comprehend. So if there's a little bit that we can do to help move the mission forward of uh, gaining access to insulin for other people around the world, you know, in developing countries, we're like, yeah, this is something we, we can't not do. This is, this is a must. So we all got together and decided that we could try to rally the community around this cause. I think it's been very successful because again, it's not like one person or one group or one, I don't know, any driving force that, that, that runs this. It's everybody touched by diabetes has the chance to reach in and impact lives in a really, really big way. It's kind of hard to say no to that. And Scott, was, was part of the idea here to keep it kind of simple? I mean, you buy the, you can still buy flowers on Valentine's Day, but maybe donate the value of just maybe one or two roses what that would cost. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, simplicity is, is really important uh, when it comes to uh, ideas like this. And I think it, ideas need to be simple in order for them to take off and, and for a lot of people to get behind them and support because they have to be simple to understand. For those of us who are really involved in the, in the community and involved in diabetes, we understand and get it, um, but we're, we're, we want this message to reach many people who are not necessarily uh, touched by diabetes or not, not that involved in the community. We want it to reach a, a much wider audience, and so it needs to be a very simple idea, uh, both simple to, uh, to explain, simple to understand, and simple to do as well. And Bennett, you're very involved in policy. Do you think people are still surprised to find that while we're talking about a specific kind of access here in the U.S., perhaps, that in other parts of the world, the access is is much more limited. You know, I think that maybe they are, and maybe it's a good thing that we remind them, but I don't think that anybody is surprised that insulin is hard to get in economies that are struggling. So, like Carrie said, this is an opportunity for everybody to join in. Um, nobody owns Sparrow Rose. The community owns Sparrow Rose. You own Sparrow Rose because you're doing this podcast. Scott owns it because he writes about it. Whoever jumps on board is a part owner of what we're doing here. And like Scott says, it's super easy to do. So what do you do? You go to SparrowRose.org, all one word, Sparrow Rose, and you click on the big rose at the top of that page, and it's going to take you to a donation page, and you can give through PayPal. Stupid easy. There's two drop downs. You can give a one time gift. You can give a rose. So, you know, Valentine's Day, a full bouquet of fancy dancy roses is maybe 60 bucks. So you take, think you give 11, take five bucks, give it to spare a rose. That's going to help a child stay alive for a month. Or maybe you give monthly. Maybe you give a rose every month. That's a full dozen roses over the course of a year. Five bucks a month. I mean, I got a Starbucks coffee staring at me, and, and you know, five bucks a month is way less than what I spend on coffee. And that'll keep a child alive for a year. So you go to sparrowrose.org, either click on the give button or just click on that giant rose on the top there. Click the drop downs for whatever type of one, donation you want to make. Make the payment through PayPal. Boom, you're done. You've helped save a life. And Carrie, uh, well, it, well, as Bennett describes it as stupid easy, which I think is great, <laughs> Bennett. It really sounds like it's simple. Carrie, you know, what has this come to mean to you? This is, I believe, this is the fourth year that you all have tried to get the word out and supported mm -hmm. this. Um, are you seeing change through it? Do you feel like this is something that will continue? Oh, God. I, will, I mean, I, I really hope it's something that will continue. But I think that change happens twofold. The first is the most important change, which is, Every, every little donation goes and changes and improves and potentially saves the, the life of a child. That's, that is the, the paramount thing, the thing that should always be on the forefront. Uh, but secondarily, people in the community are becoming more and more aware of what we truly have access to and how lucky we are as a group of people. I mean, here we are sitting on this Skype call. We're using our computers. We texted before, using our emails, whatever. Super privileged, very lucky. I don't worry about where my next um, injection of insulin is coming from. But to think about, hey, what's it like to worry about that? What's it like to not have access to something I'm so accustomed to? To recognize how lucky we are helps people step outside of themselves, help the community kind of evolve and grow in a way that really benefits everybody, not just the people in the community, but the people outside of the community who are part of the community, but are benefiting from this campaign. We never meet these people whose lives that we're changing, but but knowing that we're able to 
to make that change is that's really powerful stuff. And I'm hoping that out through this campaign, it helps kind of bring to bloom other ideas from different groups about how to acknowledge what we have and spread the wealth. Well, that's a really good point, because, Scott, as the point was made here, you know, this is not an idea that has a little TM after it. There's not really a copyright, right? There isn't a TM. I didn't make that up. No, that's right? true. You're absolutely okay. right. So just, to, just to check. So when we say no one owns this and the community owns this, Scott, how have you seen that taken off? Because it does look like the diabetes community really has embraced it. Well, I think it's important that... Um... That, that it is embraced by everybody. And, and this is an idea that that needs to be owned and embraced by as many people as possible. If, 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 if there's someone that tries to own something like this, it just doesn't go as far. So um, the, the whole thing is just get it out and, and owned, by, owned by everybody, owned by anyone that, that can talk about it or share it. You, you own it. You, you are a part of it. And um, and everybody involved with it is is so thankful that you are doing what you're doing for it. So, yeah. Mm. I, I'm curious, too, you know, the, the diabetes online community is a very big community, but it also seems very small in that we all kind of get to know each other. And, you know, you really are many people are very accessible on Twitter or you can you can reach them. I guess what I'm getting to and, and Carrie, let me address this to you is how did you all come up with this we talked about the you know, partnering for diabetes change what is that did you all sit around a table and scott had his diet coke and you know did you guys <laughs> kind of talk about it that way how did it come about uh the sparrow rose idea itself yes well this the partnering for diabetes change coalition is is a group of people who were brought together uh, with assistance from johnson and johnson so we do have to give them a huge nod because they they don't own this project um but they've helped in part to shepherd it and i'm really proud of of the investment that they've made and bringing the advocates together so that we could incubate this kind of idea. The idea itself, and Jeff is going to hate me for saying this, but the idea was actually born from Jeff Hitchcock, who runs the Children with Diabetes um, group. And it was just latched onto immediately by everybody in the room because it didn't serve an agenda. It didn't serve anybody's ego. It wasn't this, oh, look at me sort of thing. It was more, this is actual social media for social good. This is a powerful thing. And everybody just took it and and ran with it. So it was it was an awesome meeting. And what's come of that is, like everyone has mentioned already, nobody owns it. So this one idea, which was incubated by the group, has been grabbed by the community uh, of people living with diabetes and beyond that, beyond the diabetes community, into the patient community, into people who work for diabetes companies. I mean, there's a lot of potential for this idea to spread, and it's a good idea to spread. And Betty, give me your perspective, because as I mentioned, you work um, a lot now with policy, and that's been your interest for a while. Put this in perspective for us in terms of how much easier, perhaps, something like Sparrow Roses to create change and to have an actual impact, as opposed to trying to make change happen legislatively. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I think that Sparrow Rose is the foundation of other change. Um, I will tell you flat out that when we did the Strip Safely campaign, I went and took the notes of how we created Sparrow Rose and just replayed them with different branding. So... You know, you mentioned that the community is large, but it feels small. I think the community is large, but it feels intimate. And what we can do with that intimacy is ask each other to help. And Sparrow Rose, to me, is the very foundation of helping. Because like Carrie said, you're helping people you don't know. You'll never see them. If you're super lucky, maybe you'll be at an event where IDF shows some of the art that these kids make. You know, and it's typical refrigerator art. And in it, you see a little bit of an image of a kid that realizes they're staying alive because they're getting this magic insulin from somebody. And um, that to me is the key, is that we do things for others. We do things for people that we'll never see. And then eventually we can do things for policy. But, you know, if we're not living for others, we're never going to get to the policy stuff. So to me, Sparrow Rose is foundational in everything we do. It's all about other people and, and taking the gifts you have and sharing them. It's, you know, there's, it's important to know that um, any, anything helps, right? Like this has been a really wonderful idea. We've seen it go uh, a great ways so far, 
but if if all you can do is is one rose that's a tremendous help if all you can do is spread if you can't do one rose but you can help spread the message that's also a tremendous help like don't undervalue uh whatever you can do to help this cause it all it all goes a very long way you know absolutely it's about doing what you can um and when we track what happens we track how many people have given doesn't matter how much you give that that you give is important to us um and if you can find five bucks that's great and to echo what carrie said you know we're really fortunate that that j and j brought us all and put us all in a room and then step back and and let ideas flow and and i agree with what carrie said jeff came up with this idea and we jumped all over it hijacked the rest of the agenda and spent the day figuring out how to make this work um, but it isn't just J&J that could help. So if you have a business and, and you want to do a fun morale booster in February, let's face it, February in North America sucks. It's cold and rainy and awful um, or snowy and awful. So have a little campaign in your office. Put a, a little sign up by the, the coffee pot. It could be, you know, your, your local HVAC vendor. It could be another company in the industry, um, whatever. This isn't. A companies and it isn't a person, it's everybody's. More info on all of this at diabetes-connections.com and I really hope you find it in your heart to learn more and to donate. Sparrow Rose is a great cause and we're going to do our best to make our own donations with something fun today. If you're familiar with Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR quiz show, this next segment is with full credit And full apologies to those fine folks. We're going to have the Diabetes Connection version of Bluff the Listener and a news quiz. And if you're not familiar with Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, this will still be fun. It's just kind of silly. All right, so we need to welcome a listener. And I'm so excited to welcome Laura Dubeld. She is here in Charlotte, and she's a published writer, founder of Dubeld Marketing Group. Laura, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Uh, Laura, you have type 1 diabetes, right? Tell me a little bit about about you. Oh, absolutely. So um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes um, when I was 10 years old um, and have really benefited, I think, over the last 20 years, 25 years or so with the new technology um, in place for diabetics. So I um, got a pump when I was in high school. That really allowed me to kind of play sports and go out with my friends. And um, about two years ago, I got one of the Dexcom sensors, which has totally changed um, my world. I'm a big runner, so I um, have done quite a few half marathons. I um, was actually training to run the Disney Marathon this coming um, weekend, but got injured. Um, but the technology that's available for diabetics now is really amazing. I mean, it just gives you confidence that, you know, you can be an active in sports, and um, you're not having to test your blood sugar 800 times a day. So, um, you know, have have really benefited, I think, from the advances in technology with diabetes. Very and, cool. Um, you know, love love being involved in the Charlotte community and in the health and wellness area. Um, I've worked for a, a healthcare system for about eight years doing marketing, and um, and now have stepped out on my own to do the same thing. So. I'm um, really excited to be a part of today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And you you set this next segment up perfectly, talking about new technology. Because every year, there are lots of announcements of diabetes product breakthroughs. And some are useful and very helpful, and they change our lives for the better, as, as you were just talking about. But some make a splash, never really take off. And others are just abject failures, like the ones you're going to hear about. Our guests are each going to relate a story of a failed diabetes product. One of these products is for real. It made it to market. But the other two are products only of our imagination. Uh, Laura, if you can guess which is the real deal, and Bennett, Carrie, and Scott are going to do their best to fool you, Diabetes Connections will make a $50 donation to Sparrow Rose in your name. Are you ready? I'm ready. All, All right. Carrie, are you set? Why don't you go first? All right. So let me sell it to you. (laughs) So tech savvy type one teens have created a new app for your smartphone or tablet. It's called Selfish and it's aimed at at those whose parents use remote monitoring software like, you know, Dexcom Share or Night Scout. 
So the app creates a fake but kind of reasonable blood glucose graph, which is then beamed back to the parent's device. So when they look at their phone, they're like, oh, good, my kid is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it also includes text notifications like, yes, I checked or yes, I have my meter. However, the creators being teenagers, you know how teenagers are, they couldn't resist being kind of like slightly jerk facey. So an early version of the app included hidden jokes and a few inappropriate references to Nick Jonas, as most things do. (laughs) <laughs> parents, they are only half as stupid as teenagers think they are, picked up that something might not be exactly right after the first few references to this Disney Channel you know, dia booty, which is like, I feel weird even saying that out loud. But the tech-savvy parents have since created an override app and are on the lookout for updates. Not everybody says dia booty, Carrie. That's not in your everyday uh, vernacular there. Okay, that's what I'm, that is my wheelhouse, but I just felt weird saying it to all of you. <laughs> okay, so the the selfish app created by teens is our is our first story there. Bennett, let's hear what you have. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you about this great app. It's called the Nutritel Food Analyzer, and it was going to be the answer for counting carbs on the go. You take a quick picture of your food with your phone. It delivers it to live operators at Nutritel, and within three minutes, they promised an accurate within plus or minus 20%, so your judgment on accuracy may vary. Carb count. (laughs) Users could also pay for an upgraded access to more food information as well as ingredients and and warnings for gluten and allergens. However, the product never made it out of beta testing because that's when users found out that each meal came with snarky comments like, oh, that salad looks really delicious, good choice. Or in my case, hmm, do you really need to eat that slice of cheesecake? Or, didn't you have a hamburger yesterday? Further investigation showed that not only were the people behind this app particularly judgmental, they were also a division of a large health insurance group. In other words, the Nutritel app would tell on you, giving your insurance company valuable information about your eating habits. And once the word got out, the community went after it and it was scrapped. And Bennett's telling us about the Nutritel food app, which basically told on the user and their eating habits to health insurers. Scott, what do you have? All right. Imagine using a laser to painlessly perforate your skin to get a drop of blood instead of having to use a metal needle. A company called Cell Robotics created the Lazette, which used laser energy to penetrate the skin. Testing showed that adequate, adequately trained patients could perform finger pin pricks with the laser device as easily and accurately as with lancets. But the laser required some difficult maintenance and instruction. And there was a noticeable odor of burning flesh with each test. Some users said that was a bit of a turnoff. The price may have also kept this one from taking off. One Lazette device cost about $500. Maybe because you could get close to a lifetime supply of regular lancets for that, the laser pricker is no longer available for purchase. All right, Laura, your products are the Lazette, which gave you great accuracy without having to poke your finger with a needle. However, the smell of burning flesh turned people off. The Nutritel health food app, which told on you, or the Selfish app, which was developed by teenagers to fool their parents who used Share and Night Scout. Which one is the <laughs> real? Which one is the real product that we didn't make up? Well, Stacey, as much as I would love to say it was the Dia Booty app, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna go with number two, the Nutritel. Bennett, is the Nutritel a real deal? Uh, no, it's fake. (laughs) But I want to tell you that Nutritel and Diabuti are teaming up to uh, (laughs) fake your blood sugars, but fake your carb counts. (laughs) Laura, we're still going to make the donation to Sparrow Rose in your name because you were such a good sport. And this was so funny. But yeah, the lace set. Scott, um, did you know about that product before you read about that? Um. A, a little bit, but it, it's like one of the many things that we often hear about as people living with diabetes where, uh, you know, these things come to market and you're like, OK, this sounds so ridiculous that I'm just not going to even give it much uh, brain bandwidth. So, yeah. 
Yeah, but it was a real product. I don't know how far along because it was. It was. I think it was a little bit before my time in the diabetes community. Laura, it sounded like you might have heard of it when we mentioned it again. Yeah, it it it, it did sound familiar. It's something I may have read about. I think I just in my mind I was thinking, you know, the Nutritel app seems just like something that I could see going to market and just being a terrible disaster. So, <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you what's I funny. I should have gone with my gut. Yeah, well that's okay. But what's funny too, guys, is I just saw. This week, that um, not a app that hopefully reports back to anybody else, but that there are a few camera-like devices that claim to show the nutritional information in your food. I mean, I think that's, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, very that's interesting stuff. I'm not yeah. sure how, how much we, you know, we'd have to see some studies to trust it, but that that to me is amazing. Amazing. Absolutely. Well, Laura, thank you so much for playing. As I said, we're still going to make the donation to Sparrow Rose in your name. We really appreciate you taking part. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, Laura. Thank thanks you, Laura. Thanks so much for having me. Had a Yay. great time. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Scott. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I love the way you read yours because the entire time, every time you said laser, I kept picturing Dr. Evil. <laughs> 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 The laser. The, the laser. <laughs> this is awesome. I just had this this image of like a waft of smoke coming up from a <laughs> finger, you know. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. And our last segment today, we want to give you guys a little bit of a quiz. Um, I don't think you can really prepare for this, so I hope you didn't study too hard. But as we mentioned, Carrie writes the award-winning blog, Six Until Me. And the title refers to a piece that she wrote from the point of view of diabetes, which came into her life at age six, six until me. And I'll link that up at diabetes-connections.com. I'd urge you to read it. But today, uh, we're going to find out how much you all know about diabetes and years ending in six for this quiz, you'll hear a fact about diabetes and choose which year it happened. I'm calling it, which six will it be? As that's true. Well, I, after. I feel right. like I need to jump in because I've already screwed up the quiz. I was seven when I was diagnosed. I was using poetic license. My <laughs> oh, and I didn't geez. think about SEO and I just now screwed up the entire podcast. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the first symptoms were when I was six. But the actual diagnosis was seven. I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> have you have you revealed I've that said information that all before? Over the place, is that yeah. even is I'm that sorry. even in the essay? That You're I a really good person. Though. I really like you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed the wordplay, so we're keeping it. Which six will it be? But I also like the facts, so that's great. All right. <clears throat> Each guest is going to get two questions. If a total of four of the six are answered correctly, we will make another $50 donation in a listener's name. In fact, Carrie um, might be paying that to me. To get, no, I'm just kidding. But we'll... <laughs> We're going to make a uh, $50 donation to Spare Rose in a listener's name. All right, so here we go. Which six will it be? Next year, we're going to rename this sucker, and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, Carrie, God. we're going to start with you. The distinction, I know pressure, right? The distinction between what is now known as type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes was first clearly made and published in what year? 1876, 1906, or 1936? I quizzes. I totally didn't study. Um, I'm going to go with, would you say 1936? Was that the last one? That's the one I'm choosing. Yes. Yay! Correct! Nice. All right. Woof. Thanks. <laughs> Question number two. Scott, this is for you. Insulin crystallization improved its purity and opened the door to the time action profiles such as extended insulin. In what year was insulin first crystallized? 1926, 1946, or 1976? Mm. I'm going to say the middle, the middle option. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. It's not 1946. It was 1926. Oh. Wow. Okay. 1926. <laughs> yes. I know, early, yeah. right? Okay. Okay, Bennett, this one's for you. In what year did Elliot Jocelyn publish the first edition of The Treatment of Diabetes? 1896. 1916 or 1936? 96. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. 1916 is the answer. Scott, we're dragging the team down. We're just, yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy because the, you know, insulin wasn't commercially available until 1923. Right. 
but that was when it was first okay. published. All right, yep, Carrie. Yep, let's do it. Yeah, out, Carrie. Yeah, the, the I printer. was seven. <laughs> 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 when was the when was the first successful pancreas? I've lost all control. When was the first successful pancreas transplant? 1946, 1966, or 1986? 1986? I'm sorry, it was oh, 1966. That was my third guess. That's right. Also, could have been 1967, I guess. Um, Scott, okay, back to you. Now. We got it. Uh, w- when was the first wearable insulin pump invented? 1956, 1966, or 1976? So, so I'm thinking about like my mind is is saying define wearable, and I'm picturing that that photo we've all seen of that guy with that gnarly backpack. Oh yeah, no, I, I don't. You know what? I have to, I'd have to check my notes. But I was talking really slowly there when I said 1976. I'm gonna say 1976 then. <laughs> Very nicely done. And I will, I will look that up and stick it in the show notes because I was thinking of the backpack guy too. Yeah. That thing's crazy. But I'm not quite sure what they. I think by wearable they mean like wearable without mm-hmm. hurting your back. Portable. Maybe even more so than that. Okay, and Bennett, our last... I haven't been keeping track of who got what right. One, two, three. Uh, Bennett, when was NPH insulin released? 1946, 1956, or 1966? 56. Damn! I'm sorry. 1946. I should have I should have been a little bit more clear there, too. Okay, I think you guys got two and a half <laughs> questions right. Carrie, but, I'm all right. But, Let's uh, just we... remember that this is the sixth <laughs> quiz, and the only ones that count are from her because her podcast is six until me. Yeah, but I only got one right, and also I don't have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and she was okay. seven. We suck. I think we just need to move along, and we will make the $50 donation to Spare Rose, and I might give you each $50 to not have this. So, to receive the so I think what's day. important to take away from this is that diabetes is hard. Even the history is hard. And the numbers are always right. hard. It's not just the numbers game. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, thanks for playing along with that. Um, that was quite ridiculous. That was hard. But lots of yeah. fun. And it was hard. Really good I mean, questions. It was, um, you know, it... Oh, you're so positive. He's the <laughs> nicest person ever. <laughs> okay, so next year, which six will it be will turn into something with seven? <laughs> but we'll figure it out. I'm studying next year. All right. It's kind of goofy, but it's all for a good cause. And I wish you all so well this year with Sparrow Rose. I, I know it's going to be a really big success, and it has been for the last few years. Anything else that you all want to add? Any other places that you're going to be appearing? Well, I think, Stacy, we, we really want to thank you for um, helping spread the Sparrow Rose message. That's really great of you, and uh, we'll go a long way towards helping the cause, and we really, really appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. And also, I mean, I love that you you picked Sparrow Rose to kind of run with as far as raising awareness and, and raising some money. So I'm hoping that other organizations follow your very, very good lead and, and jump in with this. And it would be great to have people in the diabetes community and the broader patient community um, be part of this this thing that's so important to us. Ben, any last words? No, not at all. They said it all. Excellent. All right. Well, once again, Thank you all so very much for joining me. Carrie Sparling, Scott Johnson, Bennett Dunlap. I appreciate your time and what you're doing for Sparrow Rose and in the diabetes community. It's always great to talk to you. And we'll be in touch. I'm sure that there will be a lot more Sparrow Rose news in the next two weeks. Thanks for being with me. Thank you, Stacey. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. If you would like to help or find out more about Spare a Rose, very easy. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on this episode homepage. As I said, I'll put some stuff out on social and I will link up to Carrie's book and Bennett's blog and Scott's blog as well for more information. I'm going to also link you up to Renza Shabilia's blog because she is really taking the lead now on getting the word out about Spare a Rose. We've had her on the show for other issues as well. But she wrote recently that in the eight years the campaign has run, they've raised more than $261,000. This is not a big corporate campaign. This is individual donations from, as they say on PBS, people like you. But I mean, all kidding aside, 
That is 52,347 roses, which means that a whole year's worth of insulin has been provided to almost 4,400 children and young people with diabetes in under-resourced countries. Renza wrote, I still get goosebumps just thinking about that. And Renza, I share that sentiment as well. Thank you for putting that together. Thank you for continuing to bang the drum for Spare Rose and get the message out. And thank you all for donating. Look, very simple, as they said in the interview, and I'm glad we were able to have some fun with it. But it, it is such a small thing that you can do that can make such a serious difference. So if you can, please help. And sometimes helping is just spreading the word. I understand not everybody has the resources to give or your money is already earmarked for things. If you can share the word, that would be awesome too. Thank you so much to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.